Welcome to Interview with the Masters, brought to you by CGMA, the CG Master Academy. I'm your host, Ben Scott, and our guest today is Ryan Lang, visual development artist at Walt Disney Feature Animation. Uh, before we begin, we would like to announce that registration for CGMA courses is open Monday, December 17th. Head over to cgmwmasterclasses.com to view current course offerings and sign up for class or classes that best fit your needs. Interview with the Masters is an ongoing series. Keep an eye on our website for more information. For everyone who is joining us today, if you have any questions for Ryan, you'll see in your GoToWebinar control panel a small box titled Questions. If you have any questions for Ryan, kindly send them through the panel. We will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. Ryan, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, Ryan, if you could give us a short introduction about who you are and what you do, that'd be great. Um, well, I'm Ryan Lang. Uh, oops, there we go. Um, Ryan Lang, uh, work at uh, Walt Disney Feature Animation. Uh, and I've been there for three years. Before that, I went to school in uh, San Francisco, Academy of Art. Uh, and before that, I worked for a small game company in Chicago. And before that, <laughs> um, from when I was born till about 22, I lived in Hawaii. So yeah, that's <laughs> me in a nutshell. <laughs> Sounds like you've... Uh had an exciting time with your art career, especially uh, where you've landed now at uh, Disney. Um, how did you manage to get there? Still trying to figure that out. Um, <laughs> it's uh, if you look at my 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 old my old stuff, uh, my portfolio that I actually used to get in. Uh, the first time I got in, I went for their um, summer internship program, and they had uh, um, my my portfolio had monsters and robots. <laughs> and just everything that wasn't Disney, and a couple people, uh, Ian Gooding, an art director, uh, Dan Cooper, uh, who's assistant art director on uh, Tangled, they, they looked at my stuff and they said, oh, so you like to paint. Mm -hmm. And then they called me up and asked me if I wanted to go to the uh, internship at, at Disney, and I got exposed to a whole other type of art. Um, I was, you know, I was really into just purely video games, robots, smashing stuff, and then I got introduced to stuff I hadn't seen before, which was more storytelling and then kind of appeal. It, it was just a whole other universe, and so I kind of shifted course slightly just to, to move there. How did you feel about shifting course? I know we all have things that we're passionate about, particularly initially as we're getting into the industry. How did you feel about shifting your direction that way? Uh, for me, it was more of a like a like a learning. Like I'm really big into what the thought process is into a painting, and uh, I mean whether it's in games or in animation, you know, it's just uh, it, it's equally um, exciting and interesting. Uh, and so I I saw some of the artists over there and kind of what they were doing. So it wasn't really too hard. I mean, you see stuff from guys like Paul Felix and Dan Cooper and Kevin Nelson, and you kind of just say, well, I want to learn that. So, yeah. <laughs> well, and you definitely managed to do that. Um, I'm sure all of our attendees have taken the opportunity to take a look at your blog and at your portfolio. And I've got to say, Ryan, you really have some excellent pieces. Um, noticed you Oops. on the top row at CG Hub, uh, well-deserved uh, editor's choice there uh, for those Thanks. pieces. Um, I'd love it if you wanted to pull up some of your work and we could go over a little bit of uh, what you do with your painting, and I'm sure the attendees would enjoy that as well. Okay. Uh, I just got some, hopefully there's the all the stuff that I wanted to show, but um, let's see. Oh, that's a reference. Sorry. Let's move this and make it full screen, so move this to the side, sorry. All right, hopefully just the painting uh, yes. is showing up. Okay, um, so yeah, these are just plein air paintings. These are actually pretty big. Um, I'll just shrink it down to show you actual size. Mm -hmm. um, I go outside and um, I noticed I started feeling better <laughs> about my paintings <laughs> after I started going out and plein air painting on an iPad. Um, one day I'll get the courage to actually do it in traditional, but 
for now, um, uh, these are done using the iPad. Okay. Um, are and you this using one is a actually specific just, stylus with that? Um, I had it. It's it's like a Griffin Griffin okay. something. I got it when I uh <laughs> I went to go buy a, a cell phone <laughs> at a Verizon store, and I was like, oh, they have these pens, and so I bought a pen because awesome. I wasn't gonna paint with my finger. Um, just uh, real quick, this was actually. This is how much of a geek I am. Uh, this was my initial block in, which will take, you know, sometimes depending on how fast the light's moving, you know, 20 minutes to 30 minutes. And I always geek out when my finished painting really isn't much different. There's just <laughs> more noise in it, so that's why this is probably one of my favorite paintings. It's just it, it's kind of just I just scribbled more on the finish. Um, uh, Pasadena. Uh, for a while I was going out with a painting group and I totally suggest that people do that. I mean it's it's awesome to go out with a group of people and you know people if they're organized enough <laughs> they come up with <laughs> spots to go and um, this was the uh, Pasadena so if there's anybody from Art Center um, they should recognize this. This is by one of their buildings. Um, Matador I think? Yeah. Um, this is Griffith Park, and just I mean, really, it's it's less about um, it's it's more about simplifying shapes, and you can see uh, I don't do that very well in the trees, <laughs> um, but uh, it's just kind of getting the basic color notes. I find uh, I've switched from an iPad to a slate, and I'm using Photoshop, mm -hmm. and I find um, fussing with custom brushes. Mm -hmm. It slows me down a lot, so I've actually totally defeated the purpose of using Photoshop. But mm -hmm. when I get home, uh, this was a exercise in kind of like edges, um, mm -hmm. different ways of getting edges. There is really nothing more to it. <laughs> um, uh, shipwrecks, because uh, after the last one, I felt like I needed a little more storytelling. <laughs> Not much, sure. but it's something. Um, and some Wreck-It Ralph stuff. Uh, yeah, this was a starting line moment. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the background. These guys were all from uh, Brittany Lee had done the initial designs. She actually made this whole starting line at at one point. Now, one thing that I really like, and I've gone through quite a few of your Wreck-It Ralph images is the way that you play with the light and the color and also the way that you've played with all the textures. They really have this very tactile feel. The skin has its own kind of soft, translucent feel. The candy and the vehicles kind of have this combination of translucency and kind of that hard, gummy feel. Um, how do you approach things like that in these, in these images? Uh, reference, I mm -hmm. guess, uh, is, is just kind of, uh, for, for Ralph, we actually had food photographers come in and so they were explaining basically what they're going for uh, when they're when they're taking images of food and uh, you know just trying to implement it food photographers their their job is to take a picture of food and make it as appetizing as possible and so that's what the art directors wanted for sugar rush and so just kind of looking at the hallmarks of what makes an image of food appetizing because you'd be surprised uh, if you go to like some you know small little shop or a restaurant and they may have great food but you know they just took a picture of the menu with their cell phone it's not going to look as good as it could mm -hmm. um, so a lot of studying of um, subsurface scattering and mm -hmm. the differences in material uh, King Candy's cart here uh, they came up with the idea of uh, like kind of this compressed sugar mm -hmm. and I actually found uh, somebody did like a sugar sculpture and I don't know how they did it but I found it online and of course they, they took the picture purely just to kind of say here here's something I did but the light was cold and it wasn't very appetizing but trying to get you know the warms in there I found um, through Ralph uh, warm colors and fully saturated colors are way more appetizing yeah, um, definitely. I think it's interesting I mean, how you were sorry, able to ahead. apply. I think it's interesting how you're able to apply kind of rules from a a different uh, from a different career path. People that are focused on 
just photographing food and kind of just how that works with art altogether where we need to be able to learn things from so many different angles to be able to create great imagery. Yeah, I mean, it really kind of, uh, I mean, if you asked me like a year ago or uh, before Ralph, uh, list, you know, the, the top five things you think you're never going to paint, food was probably <laughs> at the top of that. But the awesome thing is, is that it, painting food, um, mm -hmm. painting something that you have absolutely no interest in, because I mean, mm -hmm. I, I eat, but I don't <laughs> food is like the most gorgeous thing ever. But you, you're really forced to kind of look past it on a surface kind of level and really break apart, okay, there, here's something I don't necessarily understand the appeal of, and mm -hmm. I have to understand the appeal, like what makes food look appetizing. And so that was a big, I mean, it helps for a lot of difference. I mean, Anybody out there who's listening and they like drawing monsters, you would be surprised how close a transparent monster with organs inside that you can see is close to a lifesaver. <laughs> the, the same principles apply. It's it's really kind of scary. <laughs> well, there, you guys heard it, everyone. Go study some lifesavers if you want to be able to draw good monsters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, yeah. uh, just kind of going through, uh, that was the Licorice Fields um, initial concept. Um, this is the Mentos, <laughs> the Mentos Cavern, it's original. The, the, the picture, I don't know if uh, you can see my cursor, the original image actually ended right there. Okay. And as was the case in this movie a lot, they kept on wanting to see more and more. So mm -hmm. I kept, uh, thank God for, for cropping and extending <laughs> the canvas upwards because that's... Uh, and a little I, known fact. Uh, what I really like about this piece here specifically is the way that you have the cool colors of the blue at the top and the orange at the bottom. It really gives it a very interesting feel. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, I rarely come up with a lot of this stuff on my own. Uh, <laughs> you know, art direction is, is kind of saying, well, we want something warm on the bottom, cool on the top, and I say, yes, sir. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it just kind of it worked out. I mean, you have to kind of come up with the reasoning and yeah. and how much you're going to execute that. Um, <laughs> I totally BS my way through this and said it's Retson, and <laughs> Retson glows in this world, and they totally bought off on it. <laughs> well, well, that's that's really a good point. Kind of from coming from a visual development standpoint is. The, the reasoning that you have to build behind all of your paintings and sometimes the strange ways that an art director might apply kind of the, the restrictions to your painting and how you have to approach it. Yeah, I mean, actually this image right now is, um, this is Taffeta's car and, and mm -hmm. I posted this, I brought this one up because uh, it, it's one of two carts in the movie that a lot of a lot of the carts were designed by someone or initially designed by someone and then I would take them and do kind of like these these paintings mm -hmm. um, and this one was uh, they came up to me and they said well we need a car for taffeta why don't you take a shot at designing it and I said yes and uh, <laughs> so they every all the carts in the movie um, have to be based off of some kind of food mm -hmm. And I, I knew I wanted, the, you know, they just said, hers has to be the most awesome cart. I mean, if it's, <laughs> if, if you're a player, this is the cart that you want to pick. And so I'm sitting there thinking, trying to put stuff together. And so finally I came up with the idea of <laughs> custom injection molded candy car. And, uh, <laughs> and I remember somebody told me that, you know, at, at first people weren't sold on it. But then, mm -hmm. you know, when, when they heard the explanation that, well, she's you know she's got the most custom car in the entire world, and it's you know this clear coat or it's this uh, translucent candy with all the bubbles inside. And mm -hmm. at one point, I was pitching the idea that she could have even decals floating in there and stuff. And <laughs> I said, okay, all right, that's pretty cool. We'll, we'll let that go. And it really has so. a nice glow to it. And I also like how you manage to really make a convincing texture with the translucency of this candy but still maintain a painterly effect. Um, is, there, is there a certain method that you use to, to, to create that feel? Uh, yeah, actually, um, it's, uh, I, I do a lot of, at least when I was doing the cars, 
um, it's a lot of uh, painting the shape and then using the shape as a, um, I, I don't know what they call it in Photoshop, but basically as a masking layer. So you lock the transparency on that layer and then you start parenting, you know, following layers on top of it. Uh, uh, like a clipping mask? Uh, yeah, kind of. Okay. Um, or, or maybe exactly, I don't, I, I really don't know what they call that function. Let me <laughs> just, uh, let me just uh, pull it up real quick in Photoshop. So if you're, if you're in Photoshop and you you paint some shape or something, I don't know what this is called, but or you parent it like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you if you oh. uh, I think if you right click it, you might actually see the option. I do believe that is called a, a, a clipping mask. Yeah, so you see there, there's the release. Oh, clipping okay, mask. release so, yeah. clipping. Okay. Oh, so I, I, I yeah, so I assume you're using the, the shortcut for it. So <laughs> yeah, I just uh, I saw a paint uh, somebody do it once and. Yeah. I was like, ooh, that's neat. What button do you hold? And uh, <laughs> that was it. That's as far as the conversation went. But uh, yeah, so I'll get this and kind of, you know, I'll, I'll build it up in, in layers and mm -hmm. maybe just, uh, you know, figure out where my highlight is or something like that. But that's mm -hmm. kind of the gist of how I go about doing that. And I'll just keep adding layers. And so I'm so sorry for people that showed up for this and see this ugly scribble. But, you know, <laughs> this is, I, it, I swear it gets better. Um, it, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do all the different pieces kind of, you know, I'll paint in the tires and then mm -hmm. do kind of the same process. Um, paint a highlight and, you know, just kind of keep going. But it takes me about, you know, maybe six hours for one mm -hmm. of the more finished cars. And uh, I mean, literally doing those paintings is kind of how <laughs> I made it past my trainee session. They they saw the paintings and they were like, "Yeah, okay, we can use this guy in this movie." And awesome. I got hired. So it's awesome. Sounds like it sounds like it worked out then. Um, I think yeah. that the the technique you're using there, um, we've actually seen something very similar with some of our previous masters. Instead of using the clipping mask, they'll use a marquee selection. But I think that's something that's, that's really good for our, our attendees to take note of, that there's a lot of great tools within Photoshop, specifically things like the masking tools that can help with the look of your painting, with keeping your hard edges, that in some ways actually even mirror um, traditional tools. Like if you were an airbrush artist, you would be nowhere without your masking. So I think it's really good that you bring that up. Uh, this, this cart was uh, actually done in the same way. Uh, this was actually originally designed by uh, Lorelai, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Beauvais. Um, but uh, she's an, an amazing artist and uh, she has a very whimsical kind of style. And uh, so she did the initial concept and they came to me and they said, hey, so this is uh, King Candy's cart and we just kind of like another, kind of like a realism pass. Um, to to see what the materials are, and they kind of you know did some call outs and said, well, this is supposed to be kind of condensed sugar and um, and uh, you know these the the headlights are kind of like butterscotch and I mean just again stuff I never thought I was going to paint stuff <laughs> I never thought I was going to have to figure out, but um, yeah, so I mean this was a, a whole nother kind of uh, technique of. Mm -hmm. Using like speckle, but also using the smudge with a speckle, and I can mm -hmm. I can show that later. Uh, awesome. I was actually going to do some material study stuff. That'd be great. Um, That'd be great. This, <laughs> believe it or not, there is an art to understanding chocolate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I did this as kind of a, I I I don't think this actually made it in. I think they went for a more solid feel, mm -hmm. but. Um, the idea behind this was just kind of that the chocolate of the um, volcano had like melted but then froze instantly. I mean, it's a video mm -hmm. game. It's a world of candy. You can kind of yeah. suspend disbelief. Mm -hmm. But um, just kind of how chocolate cools at mm -hmm. certain – on the surface, but then it keeps moving underneath. So you get some of these these breaks in the surface. And I mean, this stuff – I mean, literally the same thing happens in lava. You know, the surface cools, but then the internal mm -hmm. lava keeps going, and so you get some of these kind of tears or pockets or holes opening up. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I mean, really kind of studying chocolate is yeah. kind of giving me a start to if I ever want to paint Mordor. <laughs> I got some <laughs> I got some reference for that. Yeah, it's, it's um, clear that you had to do a lot of research for something like that. What kind of method do you use when you are doing research for a piece that's unique, has a unique feel to it like this? Um, I mean, it. I just look up, I just Google chocolate, like pouring <laughs> chocolate. But the thing is, is that, you know, Google will give you very interesting results sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so you have to pick your words carefully. And mm -hmm. I've spent a long time sometimes just maybe half a day trying to find the right phrase to mm -hmm. get the right <laughs> image because I mean I probably could have BS a lot of this but mm -hmm. one thing I would know that it was BS and mm -hmm. the rest of you know the work that everybody else was doing was so good that I didn't <laughs> want to be that you know the person <laughs> that just kinda eh, you know it's done so I mean, even little things. You know, I was trying to pay attention to how chocolate, when when you know the folds come over. There's actually a highlight where the the seam of you know one drip is kind of riding, like at the bottom of the ridge. There's that highlight, yeah. And it kind of looks wrong if you're painting it, but at the end, it, yeah, it all kind of just works. So just little things like that, and you know, looking at peanut brittle. I swear, it's the weirdest stuff. <laughs> um, this was actually uh, one of the earliest pieces that I've I did, um, and this was a more of a compositional exercise for me because I had mm -hmm. figured out how to paint, you know, the materials. But I mean, really, anybody can anybody can render. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I was sitting with a, a phenomenal designer. His name's Kevin Nelson, and uh, he was showing me you know, the idea of creating a path to kind of move your eye through the image and having things point. I mean, for me, a composition has always been a really hard thing. It's it's one of those elusive things that they would talk about in school. It's like, oh, this has good composition, this has bad composition. And the only definitive answer I got was, oh, well, just avoid tangents. And that makes good composition. <laughs> and it's so much deeper than that. But uh, and I mean, you can see that I wasn't understanding the lighting of, you know, this should be really warm. I mean, it really doesn't look too appetizing. It looks like a bird just pooped on a pastry or something. <laughs> but, you know, playing up the warms in the shadow, that, that was something that I, I was slowly working towards. Um, another early piece, this was uh, basically I was given the direction of Candyland meets King Kong. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I was like, okay. And I think I, I should uh, mention, because he's just awesome, I started doing, uh, really started doing better paintings after I took James Pake's class. <laughs> I took James <laughs> Pake's class, and that guy is just awesome. He's an awesome artist, awesome human being. So if you have the opportunity, take his class. If you can get in on time, I guess. <laughs> Registration closes like the second that it opens. So yeah, take James Pake's class because I mean a lot of the stuff that's happening in here, I took, you know, right from his class, uh, you know, the atmospheric perspective, how, you know, I'm using atmospheric perspective to just add little hints of depth in here. I mean, this really is kind of just, you know, everything I learned from James Pake the first time I took his class. I've taken it twice, and I'm going to take it a third time because James is awesome. Again, this was after I took James Pake's class, uh, kind of, you know, the trail going in. I mean, there's some stuff, some issues with color and composition, but at least I, I was getting a little closer at this point. <laughs> um, uh, this was uh, just a... a another development painting. Uh, Brittany Lee had done these amazing uh, like candy sculptures and so I started uh, using those as reference because they said, well, Ryan, use that. And I said, okay. <laughs> um, I, I think this is probably right here is my favorite part of the image. <laughs> Just uh, I geek out on that little like 
that translucent translucency yeah. and then also the bounce light and I think those are like those those really cheap mints that look like marshmallows that yeah. you get at like a I think restaurant. I think what I appreciate about it is the is the play of the of the warm colors against the the cool colors. Now that really pushes the translucency just an extra little bit. Um, really can't be underestimated the value of good color theory in a painting. Again, one of the things that I totally didn't understand the value of <laughs> when I first got to art school. Uh, we had a class called Color and Design, and it was all about color theory and value grouping. And I remember thinking I had made a terrible mistake because that was my first class on my first day at art school, and I just left a job in Chicago. Uh, I was working in video games, and I moved to San Francisco, was a student already like knee deep in loans and <laughs> it was quickly rising and I'm sitting there painting in black and white gouache and it's just thinking, oh, this is the worst, oh my god, it's such a mistake. But it now, I don't know how many years later, it all kind of, I wish I could take that class again and take it more yeah. serious. Um, that's pretty much it, um, I think I was going to pull up, uh, sorry, this may lag a little, but I'm going to pull up uh, that image that went up on CG Hub because there's some stuff in there that I actually, I, I was hoping that I could get through. Um, let's see. Sorry about the delay. Not a problem. Oh, that was another. Here, I'll just uh, I'll just open this too. This was a actually a matte painting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Again, never thought I'd be painting truffles, and so I was actually really happy with the way this turned out. Uh, it went up in the movie, and I was complaining about it at first, saying, "Oh God, you know, it, it looks just like a painting," and mm -hmm. it really started off as a gray shade mm -hmm. uh, or just a gray model. There was no texture, no lighting, mm -hmm. and I was totally freaking out about it. And then people were just kind of saying, wait, what painting? <laughs> okay, never mind. But I will, if you watch the movie, if you look right here, I forgot to turn on a layer for a truffle. <laughs> there we go. There's, there's a little behind people. the scenes moment for the, for the session today. Keep an eye out for the missing truffle. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh man, I couldn't believe that. I, I looked at that on a. And luckily, during the movie, it's you know it's got the motion blur going and and stuff, so you don't see it. But. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So this is. Uh, yeah, this image. So, surprisingly, my favorite part of this image mm -hmm. is actually the logos because I came up with those. Um, <laughs> but uh, yes. Uh, there's another iteration of this that I think showed up in the Art of book where I played up a little bit more of the bounce mm -hmm. on uh, on Ralph and uh, I think I toned down the translucency, made it actually a little more red. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, this was just kind of, this was meant to be like a first look image. Uh, so mm -hmm. it would have been the image that they released to the public, but then they decided, and I think rightfully so, to use an actual render from the movie. Yeah. And so, but uh, yeah, it was it was fun to work on. It was um, kind of getting this. Uh, this world had the most realistic lighting. Um, uh, this is the Game Central Station, and um, excuse me. And uh, it was just kind of it was cool to have just this contrast of these really colorful characters in almost a real world setting. Yeah. So, I think you really did an excellent job with. The lighting in this image, and I think that really shows your strength of that ability. And myself, what, what I like about this image is I love looking at the, the warm tones in Ralph's skin. I love the glow from the little cherry power up, but then also the really cool shadows on the the cool colored shadows on the the kind of luchador character. You've really managed to give this great separate colors for each section while maintaining consistent lighting. It's a very successful piece. You should be very proud of it. Thank you. 
Now, we do have a, a, a attendee here that's curious how long a piece like this uh, took you to uh, paint. Uh, so this painting with iterations, uh, because what will happen is I'll do the painting and then, or I'll, I'll do the first step, and then uh, art directors will come in and ask for changes. And, you know, sometimes the smaller the change, the harder. But I would say that this image was probably three to four days. Mm -hmm. um, I would say at you know at the day and a half, two day mark, it was basically at this stage. But then it was uh, you know just small tweaks of mm -hmm. you know kind of coming into the shadow colors and stuff. But usually they're you know I try not to spend more than like two days on the initial painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I hope that answers it. <laughs> uh, a painting like this, a painting like this actually was, um, I, this painting came about because they were having trouble with Hero's Duty coming up with designs, and they found out that I was a huge, well, not maybe not a huge video game nerd, but I'm a video game nerd, and I love like Mass Effect and. I used to like Halo until I started getting owned by, you know, six-year-olds. So, <laughs> so I just, I, they said, what do you want to see in a, you know, first-person shooter slash rail shooter video game? And I said, this, among other things. And so <laughs> this actually took me about half a day. Mm -hmm. And it's less, you know, I, I didn't have to figure out as much, and the composition's pretty straightforward, mm -hmm. um, whereas this one, you know, it was kind of, the detail in the background, the lighting, and it just kind of, you know, there's multiple light sources, whereas this is just kind of, it's a big blue cannon. So. <laughs> but still managing to get some of those warm colors, particularly in the background and in the rim light there. Yeah, you know, I, I need something to make it look okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I just look at a painting and I'm just, oh, son. Maybe if I add something here, it'll cover up the fact that I'm not happy with it. But <laughs> uh, yeah, so anywhere cool. from you know half a day to three days. And and actually, the the attendee said yes. That that was a helpful answer to the question. So I think that was okay, accomplished good. there. <laughs> So I think that everyone's really looking forward to seeing how you, you actually work in Photoshop, and, and I know that I'm looking forward to that as well. So um, how, how, do you, how do you get started with an image? Uh, okay, well, uh, I guess I should start off with something that I'm starting to get more and more into um, and that I really realized that at, at Disney, not to say that they don't do it at other places or across other uh, industries, um, like games, uh, live action, um, animation, but uh, the the idea of um, at the end of the day, I have to you know I'm usually tasked with coming up with something that is representative of a final frame or is at least representative of a film or part of a film, and so mm -hmm. that involves a lot of storytelling. I mean, you can't you can I shouldn't say you can't. Um, Sometimes you you just don't want like an image, and you have your your character mm -hmm. just standing there, or maybe maybe not his head, but you know, person just standing there. I'm so angry. I'm <laughs> gonna smash things, and there is no story. It's just it's a cool painting, or it can be. This is a horrible drawing, but um, <laughs> it's it just kind of pushing storytelling. Uh, it is one of the big things, and the other thing is composition. And uh, I, I was actually thinking about this the whole time uh, leading up to this. And I, I think it's one thing that I've realized, and, and hopefully this will help somebody, is that composition has always been extremely elusive to me. Uh, even taking James's class, I, I picked up some stuff, but it's still I just don't, I don't understand it. It's for me, it's kind of like somebody explaining a color. And I think you have to come up with, you know, you can you can take what everybody tells you, and you can apply that to your artwork, and that'll be great. But I think you really should try and, if if it's not working for you, like it wasn't for me, uh, come up with your 
own like way of thinking about it. Um, I know you know some people they they think of stuff pointing towards the object or you know kind of going in zigzags or whatnot. And I've kind of come up with for me and and if this helps you, that is so awesome. And if not, you'll you'll find what works for you. But so composition, you you kind of just don't want the eye sitting anywhere most of the time. Um, and so what I started realizing and, and looking at James's stuff, I, in, in case you can't tell, I'm a huge James fan, um, <laughs> uh, is I noticed that you know you you want your eye to keep moving, but how does your eye move? Um, I know that sounds really weird, but so I started realizing that your eye basically if you if you picture it like bouncing back and forth between lines it's just bouncing faster and i mean i know this is seems rudimentary to a lot of people but sometimes i have to break down stuff this simply for myself so i know that if i put something here between these lines or have things representing these lines i'm naturally going to move to this point but how do i get back and so i started realizing that well if i picture this as a ball or a bullet or whatever, and I throw it this way, how do I get your eye to move back? And if you put the ground right there, like an intersecting plane, it has to move back. And so that's how, like a lot of times, um, I'll s start an image. Like uh, I'll rough in something, but whoa. Um, I usually try and get this kind of feeling of uh, planes intersecting and uh, just kind of, I know it's kind of tough to, to see, but this plane hitting this plane. And I notice, you know, if you place this, this kind of meeting point, I should probably use another color. <laughs> um, if you place this meeting point at, you know, kind of roughly in the in the thirds quadrant, then you're, I find that, you know, that's that's a really good start for an image. And, and from there, you can kind of, you know, start adding the other tricks like zigzags and, um, yeah, that, sorry, that totally just wasted everybody's time. <laughs> Hopefully that, that helped a little. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of how I'll go about creating, like, a moment image. Um, so... Um, I'll just kind of, you know, um, I've been looking, um, I'm kind of working, everybody I know that's working in any kind of artistic field is, says, oh yeah, I'm working on this personal project, and I'm working on a comic, and I'm working on a comic, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, or trying to, but, uh, like, I'll come up with some, actually, you know what, okay, nobody steal this. <laughs> it's uh yeah these are these are kind of crappy um, drawings but uh, I actually have some of it on my computer so I will pull awesome. those up and so uh, this was a project that started time. yeah right and it'll <laughs> never be posted anywhere so or except for YouTube <laughs> but uh, uh let's see it so I'm just gonna pull up some. Okay, uh, this one probably. So I was just kind of playing with a, I wasn't sure what my page was going to be, but this will kind of, at least I can draw over, I think, going from scratch to kind of create something. Sure. So this is uh, a project I started in college, which was uh, dealing with Japanese fairy tales and stuff. So it just kind of... Uh, uh, just putting some of that in context. This is actually how I was thinking of uh, the image. So I'm trying to get your eye to move. Actually, I want your eye to move basically to this guy because he's the important part. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to get across the plane of this. And so I'm using him to follow 
this plane. Mm -hmm. And oh. I've used Photoshop before, I promise. Um, <laughs> so, and I'm trying to get these lines to lead you in. And mm -hmm. for some reason, that works for me. Um, it may not work for other people, but again, you can kind of see it in this one where I want you to kind of. I kind of want you to look in two places, but um, mm -hmm. kind of leading your eye in this direction, and then this guy is kind of basically going in the opposing kind of plane. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really try and think of it as intersecting planes, mm -hmm. like, and I want you to look here, so I just move that plane in space. Mm -hmm. um, so that's enough of the boring stuff. Well, actually, <laughs> well, it sounds you like kind of geek out on it. No, well, I'm geeking out a bit too because it sounds like what you're doing is you're creating a a dynamic uh, composition by literally making the main elements oppose each other. So you're creating a tension there through composition, and it seems like it's well, it obviously is very successful. I mean, I I think I've noticed it first um, <clears throat> from. Well, James for environments, but then I noticed it in figures with um, mm -hmm. Paul Felix does it a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, Paul just kind of he he is such an awesome draftsman. I'm sorry, I'm name dropping, but he is such an <laughs> awesome draftsman and and basically a, a, an image maker. That I mean, it, it's really he's kind of one of those guys that his images really have no like you know it's it's kind of okay. It's like his images are always kind of just have all this drama and just this feeling of action even when they're like calm moments there's still mm -hmm. just stuff zooming around and your eyes are darting all over the place and but he he's controlling where your eye goes he's just good at that um let me close this um so yeah that's kind of composition i was uh i was actually going to also go over I, um, I've been asked a lot about, um, which I find flattering, is, oh, did you use 3D for that? And I think, uh, <laughs> and uh, the answer is most of the time, no. Um, uh, you know, sometimes I'll get a really rough, primitive model of something, but like uh, for the cars, uh, for the the race carts for, for Ralph, and even a lot of uh, the character stuff, uh, it's like the hub moment. Uh, let me pull that up again. No, can't do that. Oh, whatever. Um, I mean, that's this is all 2D. There's mm -hmm. it started with a drawing and then went to um, paint. <laughs> <laughs> there really is kind of no in between. But um, I'll just go over go over it real quick. Um, so what I like to do, and I find this. It's just a nice present. I mean, really, I, I should. It's a presentation trick. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times in a 3D movie, people want to see 3D elements. They want to see things that they can connect with. And so I usually fill the back with, you know, uh, like a 50% gray. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of OCD on that. Like I'll actually search for the 50. It doesn't really matter. Just as long as it's kind of 50 or darker. And then um, I'll create another layer. And I'm just going to create some uh, simple uh, spheres and shapes on this to kind of show what I'm talking about. But um, so this is kind of what I'm thinking about. Um, <clears throat> so you have this this stage, and this is kind of it's a lot like 3D. And I would actually recommend listening to 3D artists talk about like lighting artists explain lighting because they have to think about it in a completely non-intuitive way. <laughs> um, or a lot of them do. I mean, they have to think, okay, well, I have a light source. Um, I'll just do this real quick. Uh, I have a light source and I have a... Oh, probably shouldn't. Can people see this? Yes, they can. Okay, okay. Yeah. I saw it slowed down for a second. So you have this object and how, how like 3D lighting or some 3D lighters, I shouldn't say all, but 
so they put their their main light source here and then that'll give like a very kind of bland you know um, lighting up here and then um, underneath will be completely black mm -hmm. and so they need to figure out okay well I'm gonna place a light here that is slightly lighter you know it's it's going to be providing the bounce and then they add that bounce in and then they have to adjust the bounce accordingly and so when you you start listening to these guys and and how they're thinking okay now I have to adjust the fall off mm -hmm. and uh, you know I uh, adjusting the shadow on the bottom and how the shadow will be accentuated here so I have to <laughs> add in another light um, up here to kind of give a little bit of a fill so that we have a core shadow at the bottom. It really is, it, it just breaks it down into the technical what's actually happening because they're trying to recreate that. And I found that really helpful and I think, you know, having some 3D background helps a lot. Yeah. Um, so let me just... Uh, I did a test run of this demo, so hopefully it goes <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm gonna make this a a red gumdrop okay. or a kind of a red hard candy sphere. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, let's just say for for our purposes that our light source is gonna be white. You know, we're not gonna deal with too much color change. So our light source is going to be kind of coming this way, maybe slightly from behind us. And so what does that do? Okay, so well we have our our main light source. So first of all, this thing is we don't have to, but it really helps to have it sitting on a plane. And I found a, a really easy way to do this is just I mean if light is shining on something it's also going to hit the ground because mm -hmm. The shadow is going to be there. So kind of on another layer, sorry if I didn't point this out, I just add another layer. And since we're kind of looking down, I'm just going to, hopefully that's, yeah, looks okay. And I'll play with the, the opacity because I don't want, you know, a completely white ground. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay with that. And so I'll go in and so the next step is, I have a light hitting and I'm not worried about the surface attributes just yet. I just want to get the sense of there's a light in this scene. So the light is coming down, hitting here. So it's probably going to cast the shadow a little bit behind. So second step. That was, you know, I've kind of just, you know, clean up that edge a little. So we have that now. Um, I leave these two layers. And sometimes I'll even, I never used to do this, but when you're doing like the carts um, and, and stuff that's, you're going to have to go through multiple layers to get the effect you want uh, and also have it be editable, editable, um, <laughs> uh, I just make groups. And so now comes the fun part or the more fun part. So I'm thinking, and you can be as painterly as you want with this, I find I'm looking down here a lot to kind of gauge what's happening. I'll maximize this. I just in case anybody's wondering, I actually like working in the full screen mode with this set to black. Mm -hmm. um, just some people like it with white. I can't stand it. But. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to think about okay, my highlight is right there. Now the surface property of this, maybe it's. So I'm thinking this is going to be a hard candy. Um, so really reflective surfaces are going to have like a really sharp highlight. Um, uh, I guess the more uh, matte that the surface is, uh, the more diffuse that highlight becomes. So this is a very reflective surface. So we have a high contrast highlight. And I should preface this with these are observations I've made, and they may not necessarily be right, but at the end, I kind of get an image that sells something somewhat believable.
conceivably. <laughs> um, I've and I, I really want to reiterate this. I don't think there really should be any steadfast rules to anything, uh, or in art, I guess, um, because you know somebody will tell you, well, you should always you know get rid of the white of your canvas right away. And I've seen Craig Mullins ignore that complete, actually purposely leave his canvas white, and then paint. And uh, I've I've heard numerous times that cool always recedes and warm always comes forward and that is bogus <laughs> twice a day when the sun is like at the horizon it's always warmer farther away and cooler towards you or see I just said always so I'm wrong but um, <laughs> so yeah again sorry long-winded way of saying um, take this with a grain of salt I guess uh, so this is just the way I do things so I'm going to add in a little bit of a shadow. I'm not going to add it in too dark because this is translucent where it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And so the cool thing, and I didn't learn this until I was on Ralph, was uh, translucency. I noticed that it, the object actually starts, might not physically be like this, but it feels lighter down here. Mm -hmm. And already I kind of have something that feels like, oh, okay, that kind of feels like a candy. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, another thing I like to do because um, I like variety in edges, and I think that's one of my biggest, I guess, enjoyments of looking at paintings is just the variety in edges. So I have the smudge tool, and I actually have a brush here. It's just a speckle brush. I think it's pretty similar to uh, a file brush. Um, and what I like to do, I'll zoom in okay uh, I just like to add a little bit of noise to the edge it's sometimes it can just be too soft and so that's now we kind of have like our translucency pass um, and then for and, and this is just for hard candy you can do this all on one layer if you're good <laughs> if you're really <laughs> awesome I am I am not so much, so I need multiple layers. Um, uh, and just to show you how you know loose you can be to get the desired effect. Uh, actually, so this layer is a uh, it's going to be a screen layer, and I usually pick you know for these gray kind of rendered scenes. I just I pick uh, the ground color and I paint kind of using the the rule of I know this is kind of counter to what I said before, but some things there are rules. Like a mirror will always show what's um, perpendicular to it, and vice, you know, all that good stuff. Read a book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, like on a sphere, uh, the reflection wraps spherically because it's being distorted around this object. So what I'm actually painting right here is. Uh, is the ground and that is obviously too bright so I'm gonna tone it down and already you can kinda see okay it's starting to feel a little more glossy more 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 shiny and I found um, using a hard edge but then having like uh, I'm erasing right now mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little too much but that right there for me does a lot of work as far as uh, selling the surface material. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing, um, if you're, and I mean this goes for, you know, monsters with jelly filled heads that are translucent. <laughs> and I have copyrighted that idea. Um, <laughs> so no one use it now. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, uh, like say you're, you're doing some kind of monster that's based off of uh, deep sea fish. Or whatever, and uh, you want kind of like this jelly feeling in there. You know what? That's there's probably a, a really good way to sell this idea is we're gonna we're gonna add there's some kind of seed or uh, candy in the center of this. Mm -hmm. And now, now that I have an object within this translucent material. I'm going to grab this brush that I made a while back and I can't tell you how much this is how much time this has saved me. Uh, this is a 
split up. Uh, probably can't see that. Let me just bump up my. Uh, I'll just pick this color. It's a bubble brush. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's because uh, I realized you know painting candy, the more interest visually interesting candy have a lot of bubbles in them, and I, I know they try not to have bubbles in there, but it really it does this just great job of adding to the depth of what's inside. Um, you you feel like there's actually volume in there, and especially when you put like an object in there, uh, like some kind of seed or internal candy. So, oops. So I'll just paint with this, and uh, I should note that I usually paint with my flow at like around 50. Um, mm -hmm. It varies depending on the effect I want, and I just start adding in these guys. And I may go sometimes a little brighter because those bubbles are just catching slightly more light. Mm -hmm. And so we got that and uh, maybe I'll just soften up the edge of that seed in there and pretty close to having something that looks like a candy sitting there. Um, one of the things, I mean, light is literally passing through this, so we can't really have a, a dark shadow. So mm -hmm. I just lock the transparency on the shadow that I've painted, grab this, uh, like, a, the warmest or the lightest color that's there, and kind of just brush it in there a little. And, you know, uh, that's almost it. Um, sorry. <laughs> There's <laughs> one more thing. Uh, so I have this, uh, this is, the sphere is kind of catching the ground. Uh, sorry, you can't see that with the, uh, the sphere is kind of catching this reflection down here. Mm -hmm. And I want to kind of get the same thing. It may not happen in real life, and this is kind of where you, you have to take some artistic license. Um, again, grabbing, I'm super, I have a ton of brushes, and I, there's no reason I should have so many. But, uh, mm -hmm. So I just start painting this color in the back, and I'll lower the transparency on that. And it kind of just gives the feeling of the environment around it still being reflected. Um, and again, I could either do this with the smudge or the eraser tool, but I'm just kind of taking it back. And if you wanted to add some, uh, where's my? My highlight is here somewhere. See, and yet another reason you should label your layers. Um, uh, using a slightly larger speckle brush, I figured this out actually painting bugs. Um, if I just kind of blur that just a little, eh, maybe not, I don't know. Sometimes it gets the, the idea of small little perforations on the surface. So... Um, I guess real quick, if anybody wants to see more of this, say so, because I was going to paint another one that's kind of like a flesh material. Is that cool? Yeah, I think I think we can manage to fit in a little bit longer. If you want to show us how to do a flesh material, I think that would be great. Okay. Um, We're not holding anyone hostage, so it seems like everyone okay. is, uh, <laughs> is staying by choice so far. <laughs> okay. Um, cool. Uh, and so... You know, you just kind of, I'm going to make another sphere, and I'm going to put it right here. Um, so I've kind of got my color, roughly. And so this is actually how I would go about um, painting Ralph, like uh, Ralph's face or something. Um, I just, I, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll actually, in a scene, I'll paint like these spheres, just to get an idea, excuse me, of how the light is working in the scene. And uh, it, it's you know it's a lot easier to paint these effects on just a sphere and figure out what's happening than it is on you know Calhoun's face or Ralph's face for that matter. Uh, so here's a, we'll put a sphere right here. Actually, yeah, that's fine. OCD. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so kind of the same thing. Um, you know, we'll we'll go down here and create another shadow layer. Um, 
I, I find really that this uh, this shadow layer with a light ground really just kind of really kind of just sells the sells the point. Um, so yeah, we got that there. We'll go to here, and this will be pretty quick. Um, yeah, a lot for a lot of times uh, because these need to be kind of a little more realistic renders. I end up using the photo brush or, or uh, the photo brush, the uh, airbrush or just the round brush, and maybe some custom brushes. But you know, I, I try and keep it pretty simple. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna put my highlight in right here. Also gonna put in my shadow. Um, skin is also slightly transparent, so it's going to catch a little bit of the color. You may see me go over this color several times, but uh, I want something a little warmer because even though it is a ball, it's not dead. Um, <laughs> so I have something that's okay right there. Um, mm -hmm. Now you'll see I'm going to use this, uh, this smudge tool. And kind of gives you that, that porous texture right away. And so sometimes uh, it's just a, you know, it. I could say that I planned it like this when I was painting, but I just like a variety in edges, and it just so happens that this is, like, porous looking. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, are you making shadow. little small strokes with the smudge brush? Are you dabbing it? W what are you doing with your pen? Because it's a little hard to tell from, from just the... Oh, the okay. Uh, I'm basically just scribbling a little bit I mean I'm okay. yeah just uh, I mean there's there's smaller strokes down or do you pick it up and um, scribble a little bit oh yeah it's it's kind of like short strokes like uh, okay. here let me uh, just uh, you know um, oh using this much tool uh, <laughs> yeah it's I'm doing this basically okay. or like sometimes like that okay so, but right. it's usually just kind of, you know, small strokes like that. All right, um, excellent, and it, it's a great effect. Yeah, I mean, you know, it it, it just does a little bit of uh, selling mm -hmm. uh, of the material, and uh, I just wrap this up real quick because mm -hmm. I'm sure people don't want me painting balls all day. Um, <laughs> I think you'd be surprised. <laughs> that. That did not sound the way. <laughs> um, wow. Uh, if my girl, good thing my girlfriend's not here. She would be laughing hysterically. She's just waiting <laughs> for me to fail. Um, just a little bit of uh, translucency in the skin, just a little warm mm -hmm. there, and you know, you, you you could play up the contact area mm -hmm. just a little bit. I mean, this would be you know, this is a fairly fleshy material with no object in the middle but mm -hmm. you know. and yeah we kind of use that as a, as a as a reference point for like say Ralph or something um, mm -hmm. again uh, because this is more of a matte surface you notice how the the uh, the highlight is much more diffused than it is mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's not really picking up I mean, it is. That's why it's illuminated, but it's not really reflecting the light that's all around it. And just for um, a little bit of fun, you can at the end if you have if you ever feel the need to paint two spherical objects. <laughs> that's how I chose those words carefully. Um, uh, add the reflection. That's another one right there. It's super geeky, but somebody will notice and oh, yeah. so yeah that's kind of I mean really it's it's just a bunch of repeating those steps and making I mean that's how I did the uh, uh, taffetas cart so hopefully that was not a complete waste of people's time Ryan I think it was the farthest thing from a waste of people's time really that was an excellent <laughs> little workshop I, I, I really think so I think you really were able to break down how to render an image to its basis level, and it's not often that you get the opportunity to have that done by such an excellent artist as yourself. So, Ryan, I really want to thank you for your time here today. Really, really do appreciate that. And uh, to all of our attendees, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us. 
Um, sorry for those uh, whose questions uh, we didn't have an opportunity oh, to get to. There were questions. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, we were. I was actually asking some of those questions as you were going through, oh, and okay. um, you, you managed to answer a lot of those questions uh, with your with your little example here itself. So again, thanks so much, Ryan. You really did an excellent job, and thank you to the attendees. I did want to remind everyone who is joining us today that registration for CGMA courses is open Monday, December 17th. Head over to cgmwmasterclasses.com to view current course offerings and sign up for the class or classes that best fit your needs. And again, Interview with the Masters is an ongoing series. Keep an eye on our website for more information. And a big thanks to Ryan for joining us today. Thanks for having me.